Lord. Alrighty, thank you all for joining in. This is Mitzi Thinking. This is, um, uh, we have a special guest for today. We have William. He's going to be discussing with us the taboo about men being a little bit sensitive and how that is not a good thing in our day and age in our society since most men usually are supposed to be masculine. And we're just going to be talking about how being sensitive is okay for a man, you know. So um, if you don't mind introducing yourself, William. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, William Allen. Thanks for having me on. Um, I've uh, written a couple of books on a personality trait called uh, Sensory Processing Sensitivity, which typically people call highly sensitive. That's kind of the popular name for it. Um, but uh, I had written, started writing a blog back in 2016 about high sensitivity in men. I found out kind of later in life I'm in my mid 60s now. I didn't find out till almost 50 that I had this personality trait. I didn't even know it existed. And Dr. Elaine Aaron wrote a book in the mid 90s and she talked about the trait. Um, and uh, when I first read it as a man, I did not want to identify with it. I thought, well, you know, everything in the book sounds like me, but this word sensitive is not working for me. And I did not want to sort of adopt that as a personality characteristic. So it took me about 10 years um, of finally coming to terms with it. When I started working on the blog, um, I started to embrace the trait and I did research on it and so forth. And that kind of uh, led into me writing the book. So that's kind of where I came from. My background is I worked in corporate America for a large bank in the US. I was an information technology manager for many years, retired around 2010 and pivoted a little bit, trying to do some different things. I uh, became a, what I call a hypno coach and I was doing this business out of Bend, Oregon and I did neurofeedback brain training. And interestingly enough, a lot of people who came to see me for stuff um, were highly sensitive people and did not know it. And so it was really great helping them discover the trait. And, and again, it kind of gave me some incentive to, to want to sit down and write, get my hands around the trait and, and learn as much as I could about it. But as you said in the introduction, it is kind of one of those things that uh, even highly sensitive men don't want to embrace it because they really don't understand what the trait's about. Um, I mean, I, I, it's kind of surprising that you said that you didn't even realize that you had it until you were almost 60 years old. So I bet it was pretty difficult to have your family respond to your sensitivity growing up and just and during the society of um, the generation that you grew up in. I bet it was very difficult to even express your feelings and to even acknowledge what you were going through inside, because even now today, men and women still have that issue of just acknowledging their emotions, acknowledging the sensitivity and things of that nature. So how did your family respond to you growing up? Was it just well, one of those keep redirecting into a masculine personality? Well, here's the thing about it. High sensitivity is a genetic trait, okay? So, you know, it is inherited. It's an inheritable trait. My mother was highly sensitive. My dad was highly sensitive. Neither one of them knew about the trait either. In other words, I knew there was something different about me. And I knew that there was something that I couldn't put my finger on. And believe me, I heard enough times throughout the course of my life, you're too sensitive. You're too sensitive, right? to the point where I kept associating being sensitive with being negative, right? Um, but my dad would always try to, you know, give me that kind of line about don't be so, uh, don't, he used to say, are you a man or a mouse, right? Mm -hmm. Which basically means you need to man up even if you're four years old. You've got to quit being a little boy. You've got to be a man. That's what his generation learned. And my generation learned the same thing. So at that time, there wasn't a personality characteristic that had been defined. And that did not take place until much later in my life that I even found out about it after the book had come out from Dr. Elaine Aaron. So my family kind of understood because it kind of was a family trait all over the family, the sensitivity. But as you were saying, social because we were all socialized to think that men can't be sensitive they can't be emotional and they can't sure as heck be vulnerable, right? 
They can't ask for help. You got to know everything. So it was difficult for me growing up, which is one of the reasons the first book I wrote about my sort of personal experiences and the things that I went through and so forth mm -hmm. um, came about as a result of me reflecting back on my life having done that. And I, even after I discovered it, Mitzi, I was 10 years before I would put my hand around it and say, okay, I'm a sensitive man and I'm okay with it. Yeah, I could imagine that it must have been really hard to even acknowledge and accept within yourself because now you have to basically disregard everything that you grew up learning and disregard everything that your family and everybody else has taught you about being a man, you know, and I think this is a good thing that you've done is um, write this book and le to let other men know that it's okay. It's okay to acknowledge your emotions. It's okay to express what you're feeling. It's okay to al allow other people to not fully understand what you're feeling and what you're going through, you know, because that's part of life. And I think a lot of people um, need to acknowledge that. And um, and do you think this is kind of like the antidote to... Um, to destroy that toxic masculinity, you know, is basically acknowledging it? Well, here's the thing about it. Oh, there's lots of research that's coming out now uh, to get back to your point about not acknowledging your emotions. doesn't matter if you're highly sensitive or not. For highly sensitive people like myself, it's really not a choice. I mean, it, it's going to come out one way or the other because we are more in tune to our emotions and we have a, a great deal more emotional reactivity. But what they're finding in the research is because men have been socialized for so long to not express these emotions and these feelings and not ask for help, that it's causing other behaviors in men that I would say kind of create this mood uh, or mode of toxic masculinity. It can create aggression in men. If they can't express these things, they get aggressive. That's a little bit more accepted in our society, believe it or not, for men to be more aggressive. Well, that aggression can lead to harmful behaviors to other people, right? That's very Family true. members, very true. partners, whatever, or other men. Uh, and so that's one of the things that stops that. The other thing is that there is an increased rate of suicide among men because they don't know how to ask for help. The older they get, they start realizing at some point, you know, they can't uh, figure this problem out. And it doesn't, I guess, doesn't dawn on them. All you have to do is ask for help, right? There's lots of help out there if you ask for it. So I think sensitive men, once they in, sort of embrace the trait and understand the trait, um, they can be role models for other men, modeling for other men to, what it's like to be able to be expressive in emotion. And I'm not talking about breaking down in every little thing and, 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 and losing your sort of emotional regulation, mm -hmm. but it's allowing these human emotions to be expressed, even if you're a man, right? Mm -hmm. And you're right, a lot of women have adopted this masculine model that, especially in corporate environments where they think that's the only way I'm going to get anywhere is if I'm more like a man than being more like myself, that kind of thing is, is unfortunately spreading. So I really think that highly sensitive people and especially highly sensitive men, being able to express themselves openly and be authentic about who they are is a good way of modeling this for other men. Now, what I found out too is that there are a lot of men that are in say the Gen Z and the millennial generation that are more open to this idea. This whole idea of masculinity that has been cultivated through the centuries is not really working for them. And so I have great hope that the millennials and the Gen Zers and probably those after them uh, are going to be the ones who set the new bar for what we define as masculine and feminine and more importantly, what it's like to be a human being, just be human. Yeah, and I think that's the thing that a lot of people just forget is that we're all human beings. If you take away the race, you take away the sex, you take away the culture, you take away the color, you take away the job, the finances, all of that, and you break it down or just skeleton and bones and muscles, it comes down to we're all human beings, you know? And I think that's what people need to remember and need to take a step back and realize it's not about who's the most strongest or powerful or wisest or beautiful. It's about are you able to in tune with yourself? Are you are, are you connected within yourself? And a lot of people aren't connected within within themselves. And it comes down to 
following the crowd and following the flow of the wind and just trying to just keep up with the Jones, you know, and like you said, women are now adapting that masculine personality because they're just trying to keep up with men and they're just trying to keep up with the society. And, you know, and men are just trying to get more masculine because they feel like they have to empower women. And it's just, it, and it's, it baffles me because it's just take a second, take a, that one second step back and just acknowledge everything that's going around you. And I feel like you you had to do that within yourself, you know, for you to be even able to acknowledge this sensitivity within yourself. I feel that you have to do that. You know, you had to take that moment to just reflect on everything, rationalize and everything and realize, you know what, I'm a sensitive man, but it's OK. It doesn't def it doesn't define me in a negative way, it defines me in a greater way because I finally accepted it. And the fact that you were able to create those books and you were able to help other men and other people just realize, you know, I am a little sensitive, you know, that I'm, I applaud you on that. You know, that's that's a great thing within yourself that you had overcome. And I, I believe that you also helped a lot of people overcome that as well. That's why when you, you brought up the opportunity to have an interview with you, I was like, oh my goodness, yes, this is a great opportunity to share with the world and to share with the other people that that sensitive men exist and it's okay to be sensitive but um my next question is what are the traits like what did you realize that made you a little bit more sensitive than other men you know and are you able to see that in other men as well that there are a little bit more sensitive yeah well let, let me just say this the personality trait of high sensitivity or sensory processing sensitivity is not the sole defining trait for an individual right so I, I'm HSP, but um, I had a unique environment I grew up with, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm qualifying that by saying all HSPs aren't the same. However, let me give you the rundown, the quick definition of what a highly sensitive person is. This is the scientifically evidence-based portion. And there's a lot of people writing about sensitive people out there that go outside of that, which is okay, but the core is this. If you think of this acronym, D-O-E-S, does, the D stands for depth of processing. Highly sensitive people process information very deeply. So when you say something hurtful to a highly sensitive person, they take it very deep and they'll examine it one way to, to Sunday, right? A million different ways they'll look at this, trying to figure out what it is that you meant by what you said, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not the only thing we process deeply. We process things that we see around us, problems. We're great problem solvers. We're very creative people. And it's that depth of processing that we do that. Okay. The second letter, the second letter is O. And that means, uh, stands for overstimulation. We have a tendency to be overstimulated. This is probably one of those things that most people will notice about a highly sensitive person is they get overwhelmed. All this mm -hmm. sensory information coming in, all this processing they're doing, can be overwhelming at times. I like to like think of it like an aperture on a camera. For highly sensitive people, their aperture is a little more open and they're getting more information. So that information can add up after a while. The E stands for emotional reactivity. That's another thing most people notice. We're a very deeply feeling emotional individuals. A movie might move us, a sunset, or it could be something that a person says. We fall in love very deeply, you know, that kind of thing. So that's part of our makeup is that emotional part. And that go, ties back into that being a man and allowing that emotion to show. The other part of that E is the empathy part. We're very empathetic. That's why highly sensitive people tend to be in the helping professions, coaches, teachers, uh, doctors, psychologists. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah that's that makes why a they lot do of sense. that. Because they, they, they want to help people. And the last thing, uh, Mitzi, is this, uh, letter S, which stands for sensing the subtle in the environment. So we pick out things that other people miss. There's a reason for that. There's an evolutionary reason for that. We could talk about later. But the idea is that we're able to, if you were to walk into a party with a highly sensitive person, what will likely be the person that will tell you the music's too loud. There's somebody in the other side of the room. It's got too strong a perfume or cologne on. The hors d'oeuvres are too salty, you know, and that kind of thing. They, okay. and they can pick the vibe up in the room too. That's just like this, everybody seems to be angry in here. So everybody's, you know, a little crazy, whatever. So those four letters, D-O-E-S, are the, the defining characteristics for that. So if you know of somebody that's highly sensitive, they would have 
all four of those characteristics to one level or another. And that's kind of the defining definition of what a highly sensitive person is and why sensitive people are the way they are. Wow. Well, that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. When you were describing the does and breaking it down, I was just reflecting on my own life. Like, you know what? Maybe I'm a little sensitive. <laughs> because I mean, everything that you've stated, I mean, I, I pick up on that. I pick up on the vibes. I, I I can smell things. I can just read people's energy sometimes. I'm just like, you know what? This crowd is just a little too much for me. And I, I see what you mean. That, it makes, that makes perfect sense. You're just more in tune with than yourself, you know, and I don't think it should matter if you're a man or if, if you're a woman, if you're more in tune with your sensitivity. I think people should just embrace the fact that, you know, you know how to pay attention. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You just pay attention well, it, a lot more than others. It's looking at it now, I think, more like a gift. And you know, there are challenges yeah. to being a highly sensitive person. You know, all those things add up to sometimes this overwhelm and overstimulation, which means that you've got to learn how to deal with that. But there are ways and things that you can do, whether it's breathing or meditation or doing some kind of uh, uh, listening to a, an app on your phone like Calm, which is an, a good app for listening to sounds to help calm your mind down. Those are all things that you can do. Getting out in nature, taking a walk, that will help deter some of this overwhelm that you get from just the fact that you're more alert, you're more open to things. Um, and I think the idea is to start seeing it as a gift because it really is. And if you can start channeling that energy uh, instead of being so wary of it, so negative about it, you realize that it is a gift and it can be useful and helpful. And, and, and you can use your creativity in, in lots of ways to help other people. No, you're absolutely right. So I have a couple more questions. Um, what is your opinion on to toxic masculinity? I don't think I um, I asked you that question, but if you don't mind, what do you? How do you feel about that as a man? Like, I I mean, I never I've asked certain men about it, and they're just eh, it's just something that we have to deal with. It's just something that you just learn to just get over. But for you, how does that really make you feel? How has that made you feel since you were younger? You know what I mean? That masculinity push. Well, you know? I you know, it's only been lately that they've attached this term to it, toxic masculinity. For a lot of men, you know, it's a it's a turnoff because they don't want to know. They associate that all masculinity, all forms of masculinity are toxic. And because they're a man and because they're identifying as being masculine, that somehow they're toxic. That's not really my interpretation of what it is. Toxic masculinity can certainly be toxic for other people that are not men, you know, women particularly, but um, it is not necessarily uh, without having its um, detriments to men. As I stated earlier in, in the conversation, men, because men are, are locked into this, this masculine form that we've had for so long where men are dominant men have all the answers men are logical they're not emotional that you know they can't be intuitive any of that kind of stuff they're shutting off a whole part of their abilities as a human being and part of that that not looking for help not being vulnerable not allowing yourself to express emotion which is a very fundamental human characteristic mm -hmm. they are harming themselves physically as well as emotionally and mentally. So the idea that toxic masculinity has created such a buzz lately because of what some men aggressively do uh, and behaviors that are inappropriate by anybody's definition. Correct. Um, that's part of that whole larger masculine model that we've been following for centuries, right? Mm -hmm. That's the part I think that needs to be redefined. And I think we need to separate men from this model of masculinity. I look at masculinity as like a coat you wear or, or a costume if you're an actor, right? You just put it on, you go outside, you're a masculine guy. But that can be redone. That can be redefined. That can be retailored, if you will, without throwing men out in the process. Men aren't the problem. It's this notion that we're walking around in these old masculine costumes that no longer fit our world, right? Yeah. This is not 1950 America. This is not 1850 America. This is 
that we're almost at 2050. And this is a completely different world mm -hmm. than I grew up with and my parents grew up with and so many other people I've grown up with. It's changing. And there's more of a, a, a push towards equality and recognizing people for who they are, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's part of this is going to be at some point, there's going to be a redefinition of what masculinity is. So I'm hopeful about that. I say use the word toxic masculinity only because that's a common term that's used today, um, but it also is toxic to men. And that's the reason why I'm very uh, much advocating that we do away with that because it's mm -hmm. harming men and you know their relationships with other people, their children, uh, their partners, uh, and the people they have relationships with at work and everywhere else. No, I agree. I agree. I think that pressure to be masculine and manly is very hard just because now that I have a son and I don't want to put those old school opinions about being a man and not being able to cry and not being able to, to, to express what they're feeling. You know, that's something that me and my husband have a debate about all the time, because it's like, I don't want to put that pressure on him, you know, and that's what it is. Men deal with a lot of pressure. They deal with the pressures of, like you said, of, of having all the answers and just not being able to cry and just knowing, knowing everything and how to fix something and being able to, to fix a car or fix a sink, you know, you're supposed to automatically be born with all of this type of contracting and all this random stuff and it's not fair you know it's not fair because certain men don't know how to fix something and as soon as you don't know how to fix something or change a tire you're considered no longer manly enough you know you're not manly enough for me or and I don't think that's fair because people if, if people are able to accept women as they are then they should be able to accept men as they are you know and like you said i wish that they do change the definition of masculine so that the new generation that grows up they don't have to feel like they have to conform themselves to meet that definition you know and i think with your books that you have written you know i was br i was briefly um reading through and it just it's a good way for for the next generation to start that process, you know, to spread the word and to to let the next generation know that it's okay. You, however you are as an individual, as a man, as a boy, then that's what it is. You know, that's what a masculine person is, is whatever you decide to acknowledge and accept within yourself. And and I think that is very great. Like I, I, it, it inspired, I'm, I'm not all the way done, but I've been reading a few pages and it's really good, you know, and I think the next gener generation and I think my audience and whoever's dealing with this sensitivity conflict within themselves, they should really explore this option because it's, it's more than what people say. Cause it's like, you, you've seen the commercials with the calming and like, Oh, stay calm. And, and then looking for therapy and, there was this one commercial where a guy was trying to do um, a bench press and it got stuck and he couldn't ask for help because of his family. And it's just like, why, why are you willing to do that? You, you're willing to basically kill yourself, you know, to prove a point that nobody's willing to actually acknowledge, you know? And I think that's the reason why you were able to bring up um, previously how suicidal rates is very high because of this um, misconception of the world is perceiving on men alone. And I, and I do think that's a problem, you know, people need to step up and speak up and just let men know, because I have been seeing that there's been a higher rate on men now versus women. And I think a little bit of part of it is not feeling like you're good enough. You know, men feel that too, you know, and people need to stop thinking that it's just women that feel these type of emotions and go through these type of depressions because it's not true. Men go through emotions too. Men feel sadness. Men feel incomplete. Men feel like incompetent sometimes, you know? And I think the fact that once we acknowledge this, then it could, that's our first step to leading into a newer type of perspective in our world you know so thank you <laughs> yeah. yeah well you're welcome and thank you for reading the book i you know shame is a very powerful thing motivator mm, and yes. a lot of boys are shamed by their fathers or they're shamed by their whoever is a male authority figure in their family it could be the grandfather and uncle uh, they're also shamed by other boys um, mm -hmm. and having grown up where you're right. If you don't do something that is expected of a man and you are shamed, 
that stays with you a long time. And that's one of the reasons why I think uh, men uh, hold in uh, these sort of, uh, and I wouldn't call them deficiencies. If you don't know how to do carpentry, then you don't know how to do it. You just didn't learn it, right? That doesn't yeah. make you less of a man or whether you can, uh, uh, you know, swap out a carburetor on a car or not. That's, that's a learned skill. That's all it is. It doesn't, mm -hmm. men aren't born innately knowing how to do those things, right? Exactly. So, and I'm, you know, I, my, uh, you're speaking of your son there. I, my first grandson is going to be born in June in out in Oregon. And I, I am hoping, and I have two granddaughters too, I love very much. And I'm, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing is for all of them. Um, and I want him to grow up as well as, the, as my two granddaughters to grow up in a world where you can be who you are first. Mm -hmm. You can be a human being first. And then th the other boxes that we put people in, whether you're male or female or whatever, those things become less important. It's mm -hmm. more about being who you are. And um, that's going to bristle some, some feathers, I guess, on some people. But that's changing. It has to change. We've, we're, we've got to get to a point now where we start accepting each other for who we are. And um, I think this is a first step. It's not the only step, but it's certainly a step in that direction. Most definitely. I agree on that. It is a step, but you know, you have to make a step. You have to put your mark into the ground, you know, just so that you, you at least have that peace of mind that you're doing something. You at least have that peace of mind that you contributed and you have um, done something to try to break away this stigma and this taboo that society has made acceptable, you know? So I thank you for that. Um, is there anything else that you would like to share with the audience before wrapping up the show? One quick thing, if you have people in your audience who suspect they might be highly sensitive, there is a test you can take. It's real simple, easy to do. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, it's at Dr. Aaron's website, hsperson.com, hsperson.com. There's a test in one of the drop downs um, at the very beginning of the web page. Um, and it's very simple, it takes probably about 15, 20 minutes to do. And it will let you know if you sort of fit into that category for high sensitivity. I would suggest anybody that doesn't, that suspects they are, you know, do it and take the test and find out for sure if you are and then get educated about it. Yeah. Um, there's lots of material out there, lots of books out there for men and women. Uh, Dr. Aaron's books would be probably a good place to start as well. And then they can go to my website, thesensitiveman.com and they can, I've got blog articles and things they can read, lots of stuff. And if they want to reach out and contact me, please, I encourage people to do that. Uh, I'd love to talk to people about this. And uh, I just want to thank you for having me on. <laughs> well, not a problem. I, I just thank you as well for um for being on my show. I, I think this conversation was very enlightening. And um, I love to talk with individuals about these type of taboos and about these topics that are controversial because I think they need to be heard, you know, especially having someone who is actually experiencing them for themselves firsthand. I think it's a great opportunity to actually let people know that, you know, I found somebody, you know, there's actually people who are dealing with this. It's not just something I'm making up or I'm just Googling and then that's it. No, it's actually real people dealing with real situations that are happening in real life time, you know? So so I thank you. And, um, and I just want to thank all of my audiences for listening. I know that I have people all over the United States, Europe, and even in the Middle East that have listened to my show. And I hope this one comes out specifically and th that people are able to really get encouraged because society outside of the United States are still living in older ways and older, um, old perspectives. And I think as soon as people from outside of the United States starts hearing this type of topics, then they'll start realizing like, you know what, I don't have to follow these old traditions. I don't have to follow my great, 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 great grandfather's mean ways. You know, like I don't have to be like him. I could be me, you know, and certain things are very generational. And I think um, just being able to express this in our now and our today then we are able to break those curses and break those generational habits that are just eating everybody alive you know so i thank you for that and um that is our show <laughs>